Today, I want to talk to you about how to keep loving in hard times. How it is that we keep our heart open, how we keep loving even in a hard time. Speaking of love, I thought it'd be appropriate since I did it last week. There's a, I want to talk about Peter and I want to talk about the pearly gates. Y'all didn't get that. There's a lady who dies and she gets up there to heaven and she sees Peter. And she says, Peter, I made it. He goes, well, not quite. Goes, what do I have to do? Well, you've got to spell a word. Well, what's that word? The word, well, Peter thought about it. He goes, spell the word love. And she goes, that's easy. L-O-V-E. He goes, you're in. She walks in. He goes, time out. He goes, I got to take a break. Would you mind manning my post for a moment? Just when somebody comes up, give them a word. And if they get it right, they get in. All right? She goes, that's easy enough. So she just kind of takes her pose. And sure enough, she sees her arch enemy, this woman that she had such a problem with. She was shocked. The woman was shocked. She sees this lady. She gets to the head of the line. She goes, how did you make it? She goes, I made it. She goes, not quite. She goes, what do you mean? I'm here. She goes, you've got to spell a word. She goes, okay, give me the word. And the lady thought about it for a moment. She goes, Czechoslovakia. Everybody say love. love. I mean, you know, God should be doing something in our hearts where we can embrace people a little bit better than that. Uh, maybe you're in a tough situation right now. May maybe you are going through a hard time. By the way, maybe it's not a hard day. Maybe it's a hard month. Maybe it's a hard season. A and you are tempted to go to this or to go to this to restrict your heart. And how do you get through that bad day? It's counterintuitive for us to think this way, but actually one of the ways that you get through a hard time is to love people through it. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, shares with us actually the second saying that Jesus made out of the seven last statements, because Jesus was struggling here. He was physically struggling he was physically going through excruciating pain, and yet he was showing us as a model how it is that you get through a hard time, to not give yourself to something to, dumb, to numb the pain, to not avoid the pain, but actually to go through the pain. Pastor, how do I actually go through the pain? I don't want to numb the pain. I don't want to deny the pain. I want to get through the pain, and that's why you're here today. That's why you're joining us wherever it is, whatever location. John chapter 19, verse 25. Listen to this. Some of the final statements that Jesus made. The scripture says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, listen to this, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple, that's John, took her, that's Mary, into his home. Let me unpack this just for a moment. There's actually been six trials, three Jewish, three Roman trials, all illegal done at nighttime. As I mentioned to you last week, Jesus wasn't the only one crucified that day. There's Jesus, there's a criminal on this side, there's another criminal on that side. After these trials, they began to beat him. I'm sure you guys have heard of this before, a whip, which is called a cat of nine tails. What is nine tails? It's actually a whip with nine extensions off of it. Think about this. So that when somebody's hit, there's actually nine lashes on their back. So you got to think about it. If there's almost 40, 40 lashes times nine, there's actually 360 lashes on his back. Many people actually don't even make it to the cross when they're have that level of torture. And yet, he's at the cross. But who's at the cross? Where are the disciples? Where, where are all the guys at? Where are the people that he walked with and he talked with and he did miracles with and he fed and, and they're, by, they're at Capernaum by the seashore? Where are all those guys? The Bible is clear that there's actually only one disciple. It's John. 
Now, there are some ladies there as well. There's his mother called Mary. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary of Clopas. Apparently, Mary was a big name back then. There's a lot of Marys at the cross. And there's John. As Jesus is dying on the cross, he begins to demonstrate to us this is so counterintuitive because when we're hurting, when we're going through a tough time, we sometimes want to, we want to numb the pain, we want to deny the pain, but we definitely don't want to help people as we're going through pain. I mean, that's the last thing we want to do. I mean, who on earth when you're sick is thinking about praying for somebody else? And Jesus demonstrates something that is so powerful, counterintuitive to our nature, counterintuitive to culture. Jesus models for us one of the key ingredients of how to get through a tough time. Maybe that's where you are right now. Jesus is about to demonstrate something that's so powerful. How do you actually lift yourself out of your heart? You're not denying it, but you're actually empowering yourself to go through it. He actually looks beyond himself. And he says, Mom, Mom, behold your son. That's John. He's speaking of John, his John the beloved, John the apostle. He said, John, John, behold your mom. Even in his last moments on earth, he's thinking others. In his pain, in his hurt, in his, listen, literally, where he's taking the sins of the world upon him, he's still thinking about other people. Not only in his action, but in his words. Mom, I'm thinking about you. John's going to take care of you. John, there's your mom. You're not left alone. Wow. Today I want to talk to you about how do I love when life hurts. Three things. Number one, Jesus models for us. The first thing I do is I focus on caring for my family. This is what Jesus is doing. This is the second cry from the cross where he's having a bad day. He's still caring for his own family. Caring for your family is an it's a choice. It's an action. It's something that you do. It's not just something that you think about. It's something that you engage with. When you care for your immediate family, when you begin to care for your extended family, it's, it's a choice. And Jesus models that for us. He models right up to the end. He's thinking about his mom. He knows in that culture what it's like for a woman. He knows what it's like. Tradition tells us that Joseph, his stepfather, Mary's husband on the earth, that, that he had died. And, and she was going to, but she, she's poor, she's old. How was she going to take care of herself? Matter of fact, if you read in there, it says, from that day, from that day, she went and lived in John's house. So there was a practical nature to this, and it was a choice that he made. He he realized it it somehow in that moment lifted him above and beyond the pain to be able to consider another person. I want to lovingly encourage you right now, whatever you're going through right now, would you consider, consider thinking beyond yourself? Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. He says, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. Two things that we learn from Jesus here. Number one, love pays attention. Love pays attention. Jesus ignored the mocking He ignored the crowds yelling. He ignored all of that, and he focused on a practical family member and said, I want to make sure someone takes care of my mom. He pushed through the crowds. He pushed through all of that, and he focused. He lifted above his agonizing pain. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I'm in so much pain. I know it's painful. I know it's tough, but I'm going to give you. The Bible gives us an antidote to move through it. And it's to focus beyond it. Wow. And we start with our family. I think it's interesting that Jesus mentioned his mother here. I think that it's really interesting whenever you hear about Christianity. I, I took a, a course in seminary, comparative religions. And, 
And, and when you understand biblical Christianity, I'm talking about true biblical Christianity, Jesus always esteemed and valued women. You look at other religious systems in the world, and, and I'm going to tell you something. There's not the same view of ladies. Uh, think about it. At the cross, there was women there. Think about his ministry. There was always ladies following the ministry of Jesus. Why? Because he esteemed them. He liberated, helped them, encouraged them, and valued them. Again, remember my mom. John, this is very important. Take care. Take care of my mom. Love pays attention. N- number two, the, the second thing here is that love provides for needs. He provided for his mother. He, he, he did something very practical. John, she doesn't have a place to live. John, can you, can you help? Can you, can you make sure that, that when this moment passes and I give up my spirit, she's got to go to your house. Let's get real practical here. That's what I love about small groups. I love about the practical nature of taking care of people. That's what I love about when people understand their, their true responsibility to family. I want to say something that's very important. I appreciate the advancements in our culture, in our society. I appreciate the mobile nature of our culture and people or jobs. and going. I understand all of that. Like, I really get it. But I also understand the, the nature of the Bible and, and the development of civilization where there, there's, there's a value of family and grandparents and aunts and uncles. Think about Abraham. There's, there's something about, it's like God designed this where we kind of like help one another out to the end. And I wonder how we applaud all the development of culture, but I wonder at what expense it's been to the family. I wonder what expense. There's a practical nature when we understand that God gave you those people for a reason. And I think that part of caring for them is part of that reason. Now, now I do need to qualify because immediately I know that comes above your thinking. I can read captions above everybody's head. Do you know that? Like I'm a master caption reader. Pastor, you don't understand my mother, my grandmother, my, they're abusive. They're, I, okay, okay, let me, let me help you. I'm not to suggest that we don't have boundaries and I understand that everybody can only do so much, but don't let that ever be excuse for not doing anything. John, I'm asking you to take care of her. Number one, it's so important that we understand that when we're going through tough times, we need to come up. I I love uh, Pastor Randy Craighead and Diane. I was really moved by this a number of years ago that uh, Randy has a study at his house and and it was about two or three days in a row he said, I've got to go home. He says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm redoing my study. I was like, what are you redoing? He goes, well, I'm making it into a bedroom. I said, why are you making it into a bedroom? He goes, well, because my aunt, well, my uncle had died, and, and my aunt is, is going to come live with this. I said, really? Because she doesn't have any kids. She anybody. And, and her name's Aunt Alberta. And she was incredible. Her and her husband, they started churches all over the place, and Louisiana, different places, and she's a powerful preacher. And, and so he said, Aunt, Aunt Alberta, she came at 92, <clears throat> and she used to love, she, I'd go down after, she goes, oh, that's a great message. You know, she looked from 92 to 97. At about 94, she couldn't hear my messages, but she still said they were good. <laughs> Respectfully speaking, I'm serious. I don't know what she heard, but she was like, they're amazing. And, <clears throat> and, and I saw that in Pastor Randy, how he took care of his aunt. I'm not trying to put a yoke on anybody in here. I understand boundaries. I am saying, isn't there some level that God has called you in some level there that we should consider how we can practically help out our family? Number one, Jesus would say, take care of your family. Number two, the second thing he would say is that, listen, when when you're going through a hard time, I know this is counterintuitive. What does that mean? It doesn't make sense rationally. In other words, you think you do this, but you actually need to do this. When you're going through a hard time, Jesus would say, I treat believers as my family. Think about the life of Jesus. When he was young, guess what? He leaned upon his mom. When he was in his ministry, guess what? John leaned upon him. And now he's saying to both of them, I want you to lean upon one another. The power of spiritual family. I want to submit this to you. 
Think about this for a moment. John wasn't his natural brother. He was his spiritual brother. And guess what he was saying? John, I'm asking you to actually look to my mom, my natural mom, but look to her as a spiritual mom because spiritual family is so powerful. In other words, I'm asking you to see something different, John. I, I have called you to be spiritual. Everybody say spiritual family. That's a new concept for some people, particularly coming to Church of the King. It's like, man, the church, we think of the church as an institutional nature. We think of the church as, as buildings, and I know that there's a need for buildings. We have to have buildings, and we can't meet in a tent outside, right? Uh, not in August in Louisiana. Can I have a big amen? So, so I get it. I, I get the need for buildings. I understand all that. But the church is not a building. The church is the people. And the reality is the Bible calls the church spiritual family. The, the Bible does. John was not naturally related to that woman named Mary, but he called them to be family together. And when you're going through hard times, that's why it is so critical that we understand the power of the local church and the power of relationship. We need family. Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be devoted to each other like a what? Come on, say it, a loving family, like a loving family. Like a loving family. Pastor, you don't understand. I came from a tough family. I've been dropped by my family. My, my parents were broke up. I didn't have any natural family. And, I, and that's so painful. And I know that's painful. And God knows it's painful. But he made a provision called spiritual family. Where you can come into the house of God. And you can get with other men and other women. And you can be loved and reparented and encouraged and blessed. And have brothers and sisters. It's the beauty of God. Always, By the way, God always makes it up and more. Restoration is not bringing you to where you are. Restoration is there in some. And spiritual family, and now let me qualify. It's wonderful when your natural family is also spiritual family. It's wonderful if your natural family is saved, and it's wonderful if, they, if you can call them spiritual family, and it's even better if you can even go to church together. But can I tell you something? When you don't have natural family, God will give you spiritual family. God will give it to you. Be devoted to one another. John, that's your spiritual mom. Mom, that's your spiritual son. If you guys ever thought about this for a moment, I don't know if you know this or not. This is important for all of our locations. I, I don't know if you know this, but Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus and Mary, they had six more children. So Joseph was Jesus' stepfather. They had six more children. John chapter 7 says that his brothers and sisters and one of his brothers, half-brother, was James. We studied the book of James a couple years ago in Extraordinary Living. But in John chapter 7, it says his siblings, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. They thought he was a little strange. He never cheated on homework. He always made his bed. Couldn't get the guy to be dishonest. They thought he was a little bit different, but they didn't believe he was the Messiah. Guess who wasn't there at the cross? Where's his brothers and sisters? His mom's there. They knew what was going on. Where is his brothers and sisters at the very point of death? Where are they? Oh, yeah, man, we're with you. Well, where are you? You ever have somebody say, yeah, I'm with you, man. Like, where are you? You're with me when it's good, but how about when it's bad? Like, where are his brothers? Where are, they're, they're, they're not there. But I tell you who was there. I tell you who was there. John was there. His spiritual brother. Spiritual family. I thank God for spiritual family in my life. I thank God for people that loved me and cared for me. And, and my parents are Christians and I grew up in a Christian home, but I thank God for the people that loved me and cared for me and took me in. And I'm going to tell you something, I, I was a lot of work. Still am. We're all in process. Can I have a big amen? If you didn't raise your hand, you're called a Pharisee. But anyway, so. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the people that took me in. I'm so grateful for the people that poured into my life. 
I'm so grateful for, for, for being in the small groups and people caring for me and I'm walking out of the world and I'm trying to change my lifestyle and break things off of my life. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for spiritual family. I'm grateful for spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters that stood with me when I came to Christ. Two girls led me to Christ, two spiritual sisters. The mom of one of the girls comes to our church now. Her son actually goes to our Baton Rouge campus. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that that they loved me and they poured it. And and Pastor Doug and all of the people, Mike Cucci, I'm so grateful for spirit. I might say spiritual family. Don't ever underestimate that. Don't, Don't ever underestimate the power of spiritual family. It'll change your life. Christ will change your life. But spiritual family, listen, will walk with you in this life. And church is so much more than just showing up for one hour a week and listening to Steve's talk. How was Steve today? He's pretty good, about a seven. (laughs) Eh, six, as an eight. Listen, and I appreciate you listening to my talk. And I appreciate you sending my talk. But let me tell you, the body of Christ is much bigger than Steve's talk. It's when spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters love one another, cry with one another, pray for one another, show up for one another, and bring one another through hell into a better place. How many are grateful for spiritual family? That's spiritual family. And let me tell you something. I know something about spiritual family. I've received the benefits of people walking with me. I don't know where I'd be without spiritual family. And it costs you because you got to be open. You got to be vulnerable. You got to be willing to be known. Yeah. Reminds me of Cindy in our Biloxi campus. She was in the hospital for 183 days with health complications from heart to lung issues. She couldn't leave the hospital. Listen to this the power of spiritual family. But her small group came to her. And they did their group in the hospital and they carried her through the entire trial. How many are grateful for spiritual family? That's spiritual family. Spiritual family. We are called to be attentive to the household of faith. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. Whenever we have the opportunity to help anyone, we should do it. But we should give special attention to those who belong to to the family of believers. Galatians chapter six, verse two, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. The reason why we promote small groups so much, it's not an entity, it's not a management mechanism, it's called relationships in the house of God. You need relationships, I need relationships. The reason why we encourage you to get into a group is we're encouraging you that you need relationships to stand strong. The third thing that Jesus would say, and I'll close, he said, I embrace others' pain, even when I'm in pain. On my bad days, and I have bad days, by the way. Ah, Pastor, you ever, yeah, I have bad days. Sure I do. I'm a human being. But one of the things that I've learned is, is in order to get through my bad day, In order to get through my bad day, I've got to focus on somebody else that's having a worse off day. Jesus teaches us something from the cross here. It's so powerful. I don't know about you, but the last thing I want to do sometimes is worry about how somebody else is doing when I'm in physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain. But I've learned this secret. It's a powerful secret. That if we'll think about someone else in our pain, it somehow, some way gives us strength in our pain. 2011, I got a call from Chris Hodges, who's a mentor of mine. He's a big brother to me, pastor's church of the Highlands. and He said his father-in-law was going to die soon. And uh, we believe in healing. We believe God heals. We believe in doctors. We believe in all that. But as we all know, there's some times when he had cancer and we just, they knew that it was the end. Barring a miracle and God can do anything right up to the last moment. We believe for that. But cancer had filled his body and his father-in-law, Billy Hornsby, who was a great man, he started what's called the ARC. The ARC is the Association of Related Churches. It's a church planning network. We've been a part of it. We've supported it. 
planted a bunch of churches through it, helped a lot of people. And Billy was the founder of that. Billy's from Baton Rouge, and a lot of people even in our church know Billy Hornsby, and, and Billy was coming to the end. And Chris called me and said, Steve, if you and Randy want to come see Billy, he's, he's not going to be with us much longer, barring a miracle. He said, he's, he's going to go be with Jesus. So it must have been the beginning of March 2011. I think he passed away March 23rd. And i never forget, Randy and I, we drove up to Birmingham. And it was like a restaurant slash kind of cafe. And, and he and Chris were sitting in the back. And Billy had a patch on one eye. And, and he, he was droopy in the other eye. And, of course, Pastor Randy and I walked up to him. And, of course, your eyes just start filled with tears and I saw Billy, man, and, 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 and right when you start to try to encourage him, he starts encouraging you. And he said, Steve, listen, God's hands on your life. God's going to do great things with Church of the King. God's going to bless you and your family. And Randy, I've always loved you. I've always known greatness is on your life. And, and you know, Randy and I, we're just, I mean, it's, it's kind of awkward when you're in those moments because you want to go, man, I, we love you and we're praying for you, Billy. And, and, and he, just, he just immediately turns the table and says, God's, and he starts encouraging you and you guys need to stay together and you guys, God's called you to be together and God's going to do great things and always remember the little guy and, and always keep your eyes on Jesus. And I thought, when I die, and by the way, that's 100% reality for everybody. I want to die like that. Billy had a choice. Even in his last days on the earth. He's going to encourage people. Did that heal him? Did that somehow eradicate cancer out of his body? No, but I tell you what it did do is it filled his soul with joy and he stepped into the next life encouraging people, blessing people. It was a way, listen, God designed us the way to get through your pain is to focus on somebody else. It's to focus on somebody else. <laughs> Philippians chapter two, verse four, let each of you look out not only for your own interest but also for the interest of others. The key to getting over our pain is to, yes, we grieve. And we believe it's biblical. We believe psychologists will tell us, counselors, it's appropriate to grieve. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. Grief is important. We believe in grief. We, we believe that, that when there's loss and you go through tough, we understand that. But, but don't stay stuck in your grief. You, a lot of people stay stuck in their grief because they never can look beyond their grief to refocus on other people. Grief is healthy, grief is appropriate, and it's right, and it's biblical, but you don't stay there. You got to move, everybody say move through grief. And one of the ways you move through grief is helping somebody else in their grief. So helping somebody else in their pain, in their trial, in their struggle. Finding somebody else, it's our pastor, are you suggesting to me the way that I can, quote, move through my bad day is find somebody else and encourage them that's having a worse day? That's exactly what I'm saying. It's exactly what Jesus did. I'll close with this story. There is a couple in our Kenner campus. It's a lady whose husband was dying of ALS. In addition, she was caring for her two young children, and she's one of the greatest servants and King's Kids at our West Espanade campus. We're so grateful for all that God's doing with Dave and Sarah. How many of y'all appreciate all God's doing at our Kenner campus? We love them. So grateful for them. And this lady's husband passed away. She was one of the great servants there, and she continued serving in King's Kids. And she showed up and started attending a grief group afterwards, which is right and appropriate. There was a gentleman there who had lost his wife to cancer, and he was one of the great servants in that church as well, still serving this day. You know where I'm going with this. They met one another in the grief group, they got married. I see their names right now. I usually don't use names, but I'll do it. Corey met Amanda, and they know we're doing this story in the grief group. They're serving this day. They were serving in their grief. They were serving through their grief, and now they're married serving after their grief. 
Serving and caring for other people in your grief is one of the ways you move through the grief. How many are grateful for the power of looking beyond yourself? We love you and we honor you. I'll close with this scripture. Romans 15, 2 says, every one of us, everybody say everyone. Every one of us needs to look out after the good of other people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? How can I help? As we move towards Easter, maybe as we see a neighbor, a friend, a family member, whoever it is, how, how can I help? What can I do? Not just when things are going well with you. Here's the caveat, even when they're not. I'll say it one last time. One of the keys that Jesus models for us to get through a bad day is to help somebody else get through theirs. Yeah. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. All of our locations, those that are watching online as well, if you'll just pause just for a moment. All those at the jails and prisons. Before I close today, I want to just say just a couple things to you. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He's not mad at you. He died on the cross for you. My question is this, do you know Jesus? Do you know that you know if you die today that you're ready to stand before God? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I can't save you. A preacher can't save you. Being part of a church doesn't save you. You ought to be part of a church, but that doesn't save you. That's where you grow with other people that know Christ. There comes a moment where you personally have to yield your heart to Christ and surrender. and Say, Jesus, come into my life. Wash me, forgive me, and make me new. In just a moment, the count of three, if you say, Pastor, pray for me, I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. If that's you, the count of three, I want you just to quickly put your hand up high so I can see it. If that's you, Pastor, pray for me. One, two, three, quickly. Put your hand up high. God bless you, sir, right there. God bless you, sir, right there. God bless you and you right there. God bless you right there. God bless you and you and you. That's awesome. That family up top, God bless you right there. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, you, ma'am. Jesus loves you and he cares about you. Yeah, it's awesome. Anybody else, pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I'm not sure about, God bless you, son. Ray up top. Church, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ right now. Can we? The most important part of our service each week, the presence of the Lord is here. God loves you. Let's pray this together. Come on, all of us. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a savior. Say this, say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past. And I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say this. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. Man, what a phenomenal message. If you're here today and you're making that decision to follow Christ for the first time, man, we just wanna celebrate you. That's a big deal. The Bible says that when we receive salvation, man, our sins are forgiven, our past is erased, and our future, our eternity, is secure and that is amazing that's a big deal it's the best decision that you could ever make and man we just want to say congratulations and we are excited for you yes we really are so excited for you and there's a link that's going to be in the chat or on the screen click it right now and fill that out it's only going to take you two minutes and this is really important because it's going to help us reach out to you and walk alongside of you in this new journey with christ we want to help you we want to get to know you And again, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And we're excited to continue to learn how to live through a bad day with week three of our message coming up next week. And so bring somebody along with you. Bring somebody to church. Invite, 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 because somebody might need the encouragement that's going to happen here at church. And so we'll be here same time. Same place. We love you guys. We pray you have a great rest of your week.